When somebody wants to build something on his property and the people next door don't like it, their first reaction is probably to protest through the proper channels, organize a petition, call a meeting, march down to City Hall. But sometimes things can get out of hand. Tempers get frayed. There are shouting matches over the fence. Sourness and bitterness and a minor dispute turns into a nightmare. But situations like that seldom get as ugly as the one that's been going on for 13 years in BC's Okanagan Valley. It's over Lake Okanagan's only island. To some, it's known as Rattlesnake Island. To others, it's Ogopogo Island after the lake's legendary monster. But for one of the valley's residents, Eddie Haymore, it will always be Eddie's Island. He saw all the two-bit real estate exploiters doing their thing, and he felt, you know, that was the Canadian way. Why shouldn't he do it? I think they were threatened by him. I think they were threatened by his style, his, his manner of presentation, uh, the way he seemed to operate. I think he was a nuisance to the community. Uh, he was larger than life. He was a thorn in their sides. He interrupted their visual uh, notions of what the, the, the calm lake should be. He, he danced naked in the sand. And uh, this the local people found offensive. He came to Canada as Mohamed Yamour, a 24-year-old Lebanese immigrant with $17 in his pocket and not a word of English. With a job in a barber shop and lessons from the Fred Astaire Dance School, he became Eddie Haymore, a prosperous and popular citizen of Edmonton. Eddie did well in the free enterprising spirit of 1950s Alberta, and in time had a shopping center, a string of barber shops, and a closet full of tuxedos. He married his Canadian sweetheart and had four children. Eddie Haymore's proudest achievement was the $3,000 citizenship party he threw in 1960. 250 of the best people in Edmonton attended. Cabinet ministers, the mayor, even Alberta's lieutenant governor toasted the new Canadian who had done so well in so short a time. Eddie celebrated the country he had joined and remembered the land he had left. Twenty-five years later, in British Columbia's Okanagan Valley, Eddie Haymore, now 52, and not quite as dashing, still hasn't forgotten Lebanon. Tonight he's just having fun, but there was a time when Eddie wanted to make the Middle East a permanent part of this Canadian valley. Eddie Haymore came to the Okanagan in 1970 and fell in love with the rugged hills and clear blue waters that reminded him of Lebanon. Here he found Rattlesnake Island, five acres of rock and scrub, but to Eddie, the site of his dream, a Middle Eastern amusement park. Within months, he'd bought the island and was promoting his plan on open line radio shows and at the Chamber of Commerce, and he'd started to build. Everything from a miniature Taj Mahal to a three-story camel. Where are you going to put the camels? Oh, <laughs> the camels, everybody says the camels, is, is really a cement structure of camel. A cement made out of cement. Where and, was that going to be? It could be in front of the pyramid there and have uh, 39 flavor of ice cream for the kids in his tummy. So the children climb into his tummy and uh, peek in from his eyes and with the reverse telescope. Even they have the music in his mouth and even the garbage disposal in uh, his rear end. You know, it's something that for adults to laugh at and for the kids to enjoy. Was this the clever businessman in you who saw he can make a good profit? No, no, I wa wasn't for a profit. I, I want, I want a pleasure, and I want a heritage, and I want children of mine to enjoy the two culture, my own and my children as a Canadian culture. 
Moroccan Shadu, he called it. A fantastic desert village with lake barges and a miniature golf course with mosques, minarets, and fountains. There would be a bakery and a pyramid and an ice cream camel. Even Ogopogo, the local lake monster, would have a place. To Eddie Haymore, it was a vision from the Arabian Nights. Come on. More like Coney Island, says Des Lone, a high school English teacher and potter in the orchard town of Peachland near Kelowna. His property overlooks Rattlesnake Island, and back in 1971, he felt strongly enough about Eddie's idea to run for alderman. He first met Haymore at a local meeting and suspected Eddie had his eye more on profit than pleasure. He came here in a zoot suit right out of Al Cap, and uh, he introduced himself to the audience as, I'm Eddie Haymore. I want you to remember that as more hay, more hay. That is more hay for you, more hay for me. We are in this together, and I'm, I'm here to make it for you. That's what he said. And you thought? I thought, how ridiculous can you get? That is, I thought, here we are <laughs> with another exploiter. So basically you tell me you don't like his manner, he was pushy and he had bad taste in clothes. Good, uh, that's that's three, three parts of the operation so far. Uh, that's a reason? Uh, uh, no, let's go, to to num him? let's go to number four. That in fact, these are all things that add up to a threat to the way of life of Peachland. Peachland's quiet and prolific vineyards and orchards weren't ready for Eddie Haymore's flamboyant style and boundless imagination. The amusement parks that now dot the valley hadn't yet been built. On the island, there had never been any development. The local parks committee worried about green belts and natural order. Others whispered about belly dancers and gambling casinos. But it was Des Lone's letter to the MLA for Peachland, who also happened to be Premier W.A.C. Bennett, that really got things rolling. If, in fact, this lake is going to be spread over with old Henry chocolate bar wrappers and dirty divers and everything else that's going to come from transporting 600 people a day back and forth there, then that's uh, pretty disgusting, considering the beautiful place that we have to live in. And if, if we don't respect that beautiful place and, and fight for it, then we don't have it. Eddie Haymore was quick to start building on his Arabian Isle. Just as quickly, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs sent Haymore a telegram telling him he had to apply for a building permit. That was even before there was a regulation passed requiring such a permit. That came just before another regulation. The one classifying Haymore's five-acre rock pile as suitable only for forestry and grazing. From that point on, the battle lines were drawn. Eddie Haymore determined to create his mecca on the Okanagan, and the government just as determined to stop him. My first impression uh, when I had to deal with government departments was that um, they had possibly classified Mr. Haymore as somewhat of a threat. Engineer Gordon Brookfield tried to help with a required sewage permit. He came up with a system he knew would work, but local authorities turned it down. And at that point in time, I advised Mr. Haymore that he did not need an engineer at this point in time. He needed a lawyer. What was their problem? Was it, the, was it disposal sewage or was it Eddie Haymore? In hindsight, I think something was happening in other areas in the government, which was a gang up on Eddie Haymore. Gang up or not, Eddie kept going. Even a government lawsuit on Haymore's violation of building regulations had been unsuccessful. And in the summer of 1972, Eddie opened for one day. 700 people turned out, but a government official spoiled it all. He told Haymore he didn't have a permit to take people across the lake, and he wasn't going to get one. That's a beautiful island over there, you can see, and I don't see how any development, tourist development over there, could interfere with anyone on the mainland here. Former Peachland Mayor Harold Thwaite says Eddie's scheme was just a little ahead of its time. He doesn't think the government should have stopped Eddie because of the opposition of a handful of people. What I uh, did not like, and uh, I'm a card-carrying life member of the Social Credit Party, I was a very good friend of W.A.C. Bennett, and I'm a good friend of the Premier today. What I did not like was that when Mr. Haymore, when Eddie Haymore bought that island, it had no zoning. He bought it under the conditions he could develop it in whichever way he wanted. But when they got this opposition, then the government 
changed the zoning and ruled that it was to be zoned uh, forestry and grazing. Now, there's no way you can grow a tree on that island, and it's five acres. There's no way you can graze on a lot of solid rock. Ray Williston was Minister of Lands. He says no matter what the rules were, Eddie Haymore refused to play by them. He really conducted business as though he was still in his native land and didn't acknowledge that there were different rules and regulations persisting in Canada. And he wasn't a very quick learner, nor did he want to learn. So he wanted to adapt us to his way rather than he adapt to our way. Well, the various government memos that were circulated at the time indicate the government wanted to stop Eddie Haymore. For example, this one, October the 15th, 1971, and this was sent to you, Mr. Williston, says, I quote, it's believed development had been stopped through the cooperation of the Departments of Health, Municipal Affairs, Water Resources, Highways, etc. Another memo dated February 72. It was a confidential memo stating government wished to prevent development of Rattlesnake Island. That's right. That, that's right. And they issued these uh, orders and so on and assumed they were going to be carried out. He, he paid no attention to them at all, kept right on building as though it was his land and uh, away you go. And sooner or later that uh, when he got it completed, uh, the only thing the public could do was to approve what he had already finished. And that's completely wrong. But Eddie Haymore never did finish. By the summer of 1973, his $150,000 Arabian village was abandoned. The only visitors were vandals. He was broke and alone. His wife and children had left him and returned to Alberta. Eddie stayed here in Kelowna. The story might have ended there, but he started making threats against those who had stood in the way of his dream. He talked of hijackings and bombings to a man he thought was a friend. Haymor now says it was all just talk, but his friend, who was an RCMP informer, felt differently especially after Eddie returned from a trip to Lebanon to get help. I said to him in these words, great, I have, I brought with me six letter bombs. So that's the biggest mistake I, I have made. I should have said six letter as strong as a bomb. In reality, I have six letters written from heads of government in support of me. He was arrested and sent to Ocala prison for psychiatric assessment. Only one of 37 charges came to trial, with the Crown trying to prove he was not guilty by reason of insanity. During the trial, Haymore sold his island to the government for only $40,000, thinking he might be released. But he was found not guilty by reason of insanity for the possession of brass knuckles. Brass knuckles, yes, aluminum. Brass knuckles would not fit the adult's hands. For children, I bought, I bought it for my boy. I bought two of them, two for a dollar. For the possession of brass knuckles, they found you not guilty by reason of insanity? Yes. What happened to you? Sent me to crazy house for additional 11 months. Haymore's lawyer was Sidney Simons. The trial was decided upon the basis of what would best suit the needs, the immediate needs of the community, not the legality or illegality or sanity or insanity of Eddie Haymor or his acts. But that seemed to be the one, the, the avenue, I think, that uh, gave the greatest hold on him with the possibility that he might be detained there for a long, long time. After the trial, Eddie Haymore was sent to Riverview Mental Hospital. Angry, bitter, and frustrated at the loss of his family and his island, he planned how he would get them back. <laughs> Beirut, the fall of 1975, raging civil war. Haymore came here after his release from the psychiatric hospital. He got an apartment across the street from the Canadian Embassy and started watching. Four months later, he rounded up four of his cousins. Armed with AK-47 machine guns and grenades, they walked into the embassy. Alan Sullivan, now ambassador to Austria, was the chargé d'affaires. Well, when I arrived in the reception area, there were the various visitors to the embassy and all of my staff uh, on the floor and uh, several gunmen, including Eddie, uh, holding them hostage. 
three stories below, alarms spread in the streets. Inside the embassy, Haymore demanded his children and his island be returned. The moment was, was rather tense because as, uh, you had a variety of militia groups which had taken up positions outside the embassy. Uh, I can't recall exactly how many, but there were, there were several. Uh, I kept receiving telephone calls from a Syrian colonel who was trying somehow to keep peace uh, between these rival factions, uh, telling me to wind this thing up as quickly as possible because otherwise the Lebanese war was going to break out around the Canadian embassy. Eight hours later, a deal was struck and the hostages were released. The federal government would try to help Haymore. They returned him to Canada. No charges were laid. Eddie had taken over the embassy, but as I understand it, he had not committed a crime in Canada. And for him to, to be jailed or whatever for, for, uh, for the incident would have required the Lebanese authorities to take action. Uh, in the confused circumstances of the time, it's not uh, unseemly or, or surprising that, that uh, nothing was done. Going to Lebanon and holding up a Canadian embassy, holding people hostage, that is not a rational thing to do. What is it? What can you do? If someone took your pride, your f children, your earning, your soul, your body, store it away for 20 months, and for no absolute reason. Eddie Haymore claims he's still trying to find the reason. For its part, the British Columbia government maintains it acted fairly. Five years ago, Haymore sued them to get more money for the island. The case has not yet made it to court. In the meantime, Eddie's built a new life in Peachland. He's remarried and has a young daughter, but still won't let go of the island. When you came back here on the bus, it was certainly a, under different circumstances when you came five years before a prosperous man with connections from Edmonton. Very, very different, isn't it? Well, I came on a bus to seek my right. I, if I didn't have a bus fare, I would walk to seek my right. Can you tell me what you're going to do? Keep fighting. I must have my right. How can I stop? How? To live without right, don't live.